My name is Sebastian Edwards. I am the Dean for Global Initiatives here at Anderson. I teach uh, some courses uh, on the global economy and I am the faculty director of the CGM, uh, which doesn't mean much because, of course, it's run by Lucy Allard, as you all know. So, but we are very happy that uh, you have been able to join us and we are very happy and very proud uh, and very thankful uh, to Kevin uh, Berryman, who is going to be our speaker uh, today. And uh, he is uh, going to be talking about the confluence of strategy and finance in a global setting. The way we're going to do this is that I'm going to have a conversation uh, with Kevin. I'm going to ask him difficult questions. And uh, we'll see if he uh, answers them or tries to uh, run away. Um, I will say a few words about uh, Kevin. I will ask him questions about his career and his life. So you will be uh, learning more about him as the conversation develops. Uh, but what I would say is, for now is that um, he is the CFO of uh, Jacobs uh, Engineering Group, one of the largest, uh, most respected uh, construction engineering companies uh, in the world with operations in many, many countries. Um, he uh, is um, a CFO in charge on, um, uh, of a number of activities, and we'll ask them about uh, some of them. Um, and uh, one of his passions is reflected in the title of the talk, which is putting together or harmonizing finance with strategy. Before uh, joining uh, Jacob, Jacobs, uh, Kevin had a very interesting career. We will be asking him about that. Um, he's a native of California, which is important. But the most important thing is that he's a graduate of the Anderson School. And that is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons of why he's been so successful. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Let, great me, let me just add that Kevin is a member of the uh, board of advisors of the Center for Global Management, and uh, we count uh, on his wisdom, uh, his advice, uh, his point of view when deciding how to run the center and how to make sure that uh, the Center for Global Management indeed does serve uh, the interest of all of you, our students. So Kevin, thanks for coming. Let me start by asking you, uh, tell us a little bit about your company, about Jacobs uh, Engineering, so that uh, uh, we, we, we have a sense of the nature of the, of, of the business and so on. Good, uh, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to spend some time with you guys and talk a little bit about something that is really, uh, I'm very passionate about, is this confluence of strategy and finance, because I think it's, it's becoming an imperative relative for companies to be competitively advantaged. So really excited about being here, but, but uh, ultimately let me tell you a little bit about Jacobs. Jacobs is soon to be a $15 billion company. Uh, we just announced a recent acquisition of a $5 billion uh, competitor of ours, CH2M. They're, they're headquartered in, in Denver. And uh, ultimately, the company is, will be $15 billion of revenue. It's about 75,000 employees around the globe. Um, it does basically almost anything that you can think of as it relates to design, engineering, and potentially constructing assets uh, around the globe. That can, be, that can be bridges, it can be roads, it can be highways, it can be skyscrapers, it can be... Um, uh, NASA materials that are being utilized to launch spaceships up into the, to the air. We manage one of the largest telecommunications networks in the world. We do basically things that are providing services and solutions to customers. So we are known historically as a company that does refineries and, and oil rigs and these kinds of things. Actually, is not the biggest part of our business now. It's the smallest part of our business. So we are one of the largest government services providers, so telecommunications, cybersecurity work. Okay, 75,000 employees. How are they distributed about, a, a, around the world. About half in the United States and the, the other 50% around the, the world, specifically a lot in, in Australia, specifically a lot in India, 
Uh, and I would say the UK is another big piece with, with uh, the remainder in Europe, as well as Latin America and the Asian the other Asian countries. Okay, so I, again, I'm surprised by Australia. Th th this suggests that it's m mining. You guys are very much uh, have a, a, a strong arm in the mining sector. We're one sector. of th three tier one mining companies in the world. Okay, excellent. The 75,000, how is, are these broken down in terms of professional? How many of these are engineers? I mean, uh, with uh, boots on the ground, uh, people that, uh, I mean, that, that, that you look at them and you know that they know how to solve which real are, problems. Which are actually doing the work? Yeah, yeah, no, that, no, as, me, as opposed to the MBA, the money. as opposed to the MBAs. Yeah, no, I, I would say there are probably 80% that are actually engineers, designers, construction expertise, those kind of capabilities, cybersecurity experts, whatever it is, 80%. And uh, so, uh, and, and the typical career, um, within Jacobs, I mean, the, the management team comes from, usually from within the company, or it's a mixture, or? It is typically, it's, it's actually a challenge associated with the industry, is that the engineering and construction and design as industry has historically had engineers and designers kind of run up the ranks, right? And I think engineers and designers are, are fantastic in terms of doing that work. Sometimes the skill set associated with that may not be exactly aligned with the skill set of running a $15 billion company. Mm -hmm. so, so ultimately, things like Anderson, avenues like Anderson to provide capabilities and understanding about how you take your tech, technical competence, which is how this company really makes money, but then executing against it in a strategic way that translates into shareholder value, those are different skill sets. Mm -hmm. So we were talking before uh, we came into the room about the different uh, components of a successful sort of combination of uh, finance and strategy. And, uh, and there's a, a number of uh, four or five uh, points that you, that you have identified. Why don't we go through them? To, and, 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 I'll give you here sort of a long, longish period of time so that you can explain yeah, sure. your, your, the framework within which you want to put this. Okay. So look, what ultimately uh, I think is really, really important, for, especially for large organization, is getting strategic clarity and translating that into when 75,000 people kind of get it and understand and are aligned with it. And so when you have very large organizations that have different cultures, are spread out across the globe, some are next door to you and next to your corporate headquarters, some are far flung, uh, 12 to 15 hour flights away. The, the idea of providing simplicity, the idea of providing strategic clarity as it relates to what we are trying to execute against becomes tremendously important. If you think about 75,000 people around the globe, and if you got 50,000 going this way and 25,000 going that way, that's a problem. And ultimately, it creates, it creates inefficiencies. It creates challenges associated with really reaching the strategic objective that you may have. And so the more that you can create an environment where every, actually every single one of those 75,000 people know they're not supposed to go that way. They may go this way or they may go that way, but they're all going this way. And the alignment that you can get with 75,000 people getting that and the clarity and alignment in terms of how things get executed in, in, a, in a large organization is profound and very, very strong as it relates to how you drive a, a strategic agenda. So when you get big as a company, um, complexity just happens. It's how it works. People are different. They believe their businesses are different. They believe their customers are different. And you start to create a complexity in your management systems relative to taking care of all of those unique aspects that are considered so important for my business or my customer. And so over time, unless you peel away the onion and you try and get at what the core things that really are important, you start to overwhelm yourself with complexity. So bigness, 
for large companies, what comes with that in comple is complexity, and complexity is the evil of, I would call, shareholder value creation. So let me, let me, let me, let me if I may interrupt, and as you speak, I, I can see what you mean, and I am trying to think to myself, how would I deal with one of the possible problems, which is becoming very parochial, thinking that my country or my culture is special. Do you, do you rotate people across countries? I mean, would you have a Peruvian engineer then move uh, her to India for four years and then uh, someone from um, Australia go and live in Buenos Aires? I mean, do, you, do you do that as a matter of policy in order to get them to understand the whole of the company as opposed to their unique, the, 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 their niche? Yeah, we do. We absolutely do that. The, the good thing about the kind of company that we are in a professional services environment, you are, you're doing your work with customers around the globe. And depending upon what the needs of those customers are, you have a talent pool that is global in nature. And, and at the end of the day, we encourage the fact that if that talent is located in the UK and it's being worked uh, with a customer in Chile, we better make sure the best talent becomes available. So there's an inherent kind of already known requirement in our industry that you better get the best and the brightest regardless of where you live and what your heritage is. And, and be able to do the best work possible for, for providing the solution for that customer. So there is inherently already something that happens within the company to, to ensure that occurs. But then on top of that, we encourage that because you're right, it is important for people to understand the complexity that may exist in one location can be exacerbating something in another location. And so the more that you actually can share resources across our globe, and this is especially important for a professional services company, if everyone in our company does everything differently, then when you want that talent to go from the UK into Chile, that talent is used to doing it their way. And if Chile doesn't have an ability to execute on that same basis or it has a different set of rules, that creates challenges in terms of executing the best possible solution yeah. for, for our customers. So, so the mere fact that that occurs provides an inherent ability for our teams to understand that it really does make sense yeah. to so, be more aligned. So let me, let me this, is, this may be, a, I may be getting into trouble by asking this question, but I, I have to. So I was born in Chile, and maybe you knew that. That's why you use this example. Yes. And uh, so and I can see there are some Chilean students here around, uh, around the tables. So if a Brit comes and runs a company in Chile, the Chilean workforce will not be surprised. They will say, well, he or she comes from the first world. Now, the challenge is to have a Chilean go and run your uh, office in uh, Dublin or in the UK. It's the inversion. It's bringing someone from a culture that maybe it's, I mean, how, how uh, uh, I can, uh, I was, I'm a graduate of Oxford. How can a Chilean from the university of whatever is going to be my boss? Do you run into this, these problems? Yes, absolutely. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. And if, if you were to look at our executive leadership today, today I would say it's far, far too. It's white and uh, white and male. Yes. And middle aged. And 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 that is, that is look at wrong man. <laughs> but it's recognized as a competitive disadvantage, I think, uh, from our perspective and our board's perspective. So the desire to create greater diversity throughout our organization is a critical initiative that we have a, as part of the company. So. To that point, we actually uh, have a, an Indian gentleman that has grown up and, and done a marvelous job with our operations in India, and, and we probably have 6,000 people of our, 70, of our current 50,000 uh, already in India, uh, so it's a big piece of our business. He has now just been recently promoted to one of the executive leadership positions. 
And the, I will tell you exactly that kind of discussion occurs about, well, you know, is, is that person able to be able to deal with the American kind of way of doing it? Well, it doesn't matter, actually. Maybe we should be worried about dealing with his way of doing things because, because the future is going to be a confluence of all of those cultures and capabilities. And, and so uh, I think in general, companies dif have difficulty with that, whether it's an American company or a, or a European company. Um, and I think uh, American companies in general tend to be less diverse, I would say, ethically, uh, ethnically uh, in, in versus maybe Europeans because of the proximity of the different cultures within Europe mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. Let me, um, I'm, going, I'm going through this list that we discussed before coming in. And um, I forget what we talked about, but I read here the PNL and the balance sheet. And I don't know what you had in mind, but it brings to my mind my favorite subject, which is currencies. And uh, the courses I teach, it doesn't matter what I teach, I end up teaching currencies, <laughs> right? Uh, you, you guys can ask me to teach any, I, I, I think that I can teach any course here at Anderson. Why? Because in lecture number two, I will be talking about currencies. <laughs> so, how do you protect, because, I mean, say Brazil, which is, I don't know how large you are in Brazil, but you cannot avoid, it's a 200 million people country, which are lots of projects, and it's a very difficult country to work in, but um, now the Real tanked, and then to everyone's surprise, went through the roof, and uh, just the currency fluctuation means that either when you bring your profits here to the US, your, pro the, your profits originated in Brazil, will, can be either one half of what you thought they were going to be or, or twice as large. How, how do you deal with the currency issues in the PNL and the balance sheet first? And then I'm going to ask an, a related question. So look, I, I, there's two types of, of currency risk that, that ultimately that I would highlight. One I ignore, actually, and I don't pay any attention to it. And that's not exactly true, but, but I certainly don't request the organization to worry about it. Let's put it that way. That is kind of translation risk. So we are a functional US dollar currency company because we're headquartered here in the United States. So all of our profits around the world are generated in their respective countries, and that ultimately gets translated into a profit in US dollars, okay? And to your point, that $100 million in reals might equal X today, and it might equal 0.5X tomorrow. But let, me, let me interrupt, because the one thing that I do when I teach this to, to make the point is look at Indonesia in 1997, okay? And we have Craig Ehrlich here among us, who's the world champion of that part of the world. It went from one, from one to seven, the rupiah, right? So one day it was almost 2,000 rupiah to the dollar. The next day it was 14,000. So if your CFO in Indonesia just went on vacation just that weekend <laughs> and didn't do the transaction, then it makes a big difference. It's not like 10%. So it's one to seven. So there's two things that really I want to focus on. One is what I would call the non-cash implications of currency fluctuation. That's what I'm referring to when I talk about translation. So that 100 million reals, well, we can talk about the Thai currency as well, but, but ultimately, if it's just worth less than dollars today and we translate that in, so be it. What I worry about is what's going on from a cash perspective mm -hmm. and whether or not the cash flow of that local Brazilian company is impacted. So if they have cross-border transactions, that are based in US dollars and they are buying services or goods that require them to do their business and transact their business and those services or goods just became two times more expensive, I worry a lot about that because that's cash flow. At the end of the day, that's cash flow that impacts the company's ability to drive an incremental cash flow for the company. And it's very, very simple, there's one thing there's one thing in my mind that drives shareholder value, it's cash flow generation, period. End of story, it's a simple thing. So when cash flow is impacted, we pay a lot of attention to it. And so understanding cash flow generation by a very global organization where you have intercompany dynamics and or flows of goods and services between countries, you pay a lot of attention to that. 
And I have a philosophy that the best thing to do is to eliminate some of the volatility associated with that and hedge to the extent that you can, but you can't always do that. But you can also effectively sometimes create what are called synthetic hedges where you look at something else that, that mirrors the, the, the volatility of the, of the Brazilian real, if there is yeah, such a Yeah, for a thing. while, the South, the South African rand and the Brazilian real, I, it decoupled recently, but for a while they were moving together, which was interesting. Uh, so what do you do with the ex ex currency? I mean, many of our students e uh, will take jobs uh, abroad with um, pay to your, uh, your uh, employees. So it's, uh, let's talk about Mexico. The Mexican peso was uh, 12 pesos to the dollar, then it was 21. So your executives, Mexican engineers who, if they had a contract in dollars, all of a sudden they were making almost two times, but now it went to 17. So those that you hired when it was 22 now are making 30% less. How do you deal with, with, with salaries? That's a number two. Do you pay the same roughly to the same person independently of the country where she is located or hired? So ultimately, uh, salary and compensation is dictated by the local conditions of that respective country which is you have to maintain a level of competitiveness to be able to attract the local talent, uh, which is, is, is job one. However, especially in a professional services organization, our strategy isn't just to manage at the local level our employee base. As a matter of fact, we'd rather manage it at a global level. So if you think about volatility in every market around the world, Canada's really hot, so you need more people in Canada. Thai, Thailand's really hot, you need more people in Thailand, and by the way, at the same time, the UK market's weak, right? So if every single one of our managers are trying to manage that volatility of your, your resource, which ultimately is our intellectual property, it's people, it's engineers, it's designers, so if you're managing that volatility at the local level, that creates an extraordinary amount of challenge associated with volatility in the employee base, how people are feeling about it, whether it's good or a bad time, whether you're able to maintain a, a connectivity with your employee base, which is obviously created by greater stability longer term. So the idea that we have, and it gets a little bit back to the simplicity as I was talking about, if we manage projects in a simple way, and at the core translates across the globe and how we do that, so when Canada's hot, we don't necessarily hire in Canada. We use the folks in the UK market, it's soft, and they are then providing the resources to help drive the incremental growth in that local market at that particular point in time. So what you end up doing is driving a management of a volatile kind of dynamic at a higher level, which creates less volatility. And if you're able to do that, and you're able to grow at the same time, you get an employee base that's excited about being part of the organization because they know that there's not these ebbs and flows associated with, with how things go in a particular market. They know they're part of something bigger. They know that they can count on this being a company that's going to be around for the next 50 years and they're excited about participating in, in that endeavor. And by the way, being able to gain access to experiences beyond your country what an exciting thing to be able to do. So there's a lot of confluence and connecting things which translate into our ability to try and connect and manage our, our global work source, workforce globally, not locally. We have to adhere to all the local conditions and whatnot, but through expats and all of that kind of dynamic, if we can manage globally, the volatility in our employee base is so much more reduced and that has an infinite amount of benefits associated with creating a more stable, more experienced, more um, uh, experienced as it relates to the Jacobs way. Yeah. There's so many good things. I, I, I just with that. love what you're saying because obviously managing the nuclear arsenal or Cape Canaveral, it's very complex. And yet the recipe for success is simplicity. So managing really complex processes in the most simple possible way, it's really challenging to my mind. 
Let me ask another really difficult question, and I really want you to answer it. And this has to do with corruption. And I don't want you to mention the Foreign Corrupt, uh, Cor Corrupt uh, Action Act or whatever it's called. FCPA. Yeah, don't, don't mention that because we know that it is illegal to do it. We were talking about Brazil just a second ago, a very important country, 200 million people. It may, may, I want to underline the may, win the World Cup <laughs> next year. They the are, are playing, so they are playing, probably, they are playing very well after a disastrous two or three year period, but they are playing very well. So it's an important country, uh, but a very, <laughs> very difficult country. And um, when you do business or did business in uh, Brazil, one of your competitors was the local multi-Latino, multinational Odebrecht. And they are now accused of having bribed everyone and his or her niece or nephew. So I'm not saying, how do you handle the fact that you are doing business in different cultures where there are these, these are not small construction companies. I don't know what was the market cap of Odebrecht at the height, but maybe as high as Jacobs. And these guys are used to doing things in a different way when it comes to corruption to the way we do it. How do you handle this? How difficult is it? And, and, and well, you can say, oh, we have to be more efficient so that we know. Don't, don't say that. Tell us, the, tell us the truth. Um, so, so look, um, when you talk about the things that I was talking about in terms of managing a telecommunications network for a three-letter agency, when you do these things, you, uh, you gain a, a level of trust uh, that is paramount in our business. And while it's very clear when the government's involved that that may be at a different level, but I would say for all of our private clients, they have the same expectation. And so uh, we, are, we spend an extraordinary amount of time in communicating, in educating, and auditing our organizations around the globe. Uh, you know, one slip up could result in the US government coming to us and saying, Oh, I don't like that black mark. And, and that, you know, that $5 billion contract I just gave to you over the next 10 years, we're going we're gonna to do another RFP on that because we're now concerned about your ethical behavior uh, uh, around the globe. So, so there is, it's almost a matter of survival uh, in, terms of, in terms of our company. Uh, I will tell you, when I was interviewing and going through the process of deciding whether I wanted to come to Jacobs, the biggest thing that worried me was this issue. And because of building bridges and building buildings and building things around the, the world, there is a process that is, in, that is required to get permits, to get people to approve things, and it's fraught with uh, challenges associated with government officials wanting to be um, able to be uh, part of the, the economic uh, advantages of, of these projects, right? And so... And that was so elegant. I'm, I'm we, gonna, we, we have... Members of government that want to be part of the economic advantages <laughs> of this project, I will, also known as corruption. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say that we have a zero policy. We have a zero policy. So tell me, tell me about your uh, um, whistleblower policy. I'm sure you have. Uh, tell us I mean, a little bit so that the students uh, know uh, companies I'm involved with have it. But I want to hear. It, it's a very important and how a major sort of blue chip engineering company deals with this issue. So what we have set up is a, an independent structure in our company where anyone in the world, whether they be a member of the Jacobs team, a customer, a government official, or whoever, has the ability to, to connect through this independent, let's call it hotline process, where they can say anything they want as it relates to anything they're seeing or feeling is potentially happening where we are not adhering to the standards that we've established for our company. So when someone calls, what happens? Because I mean, I call uh, 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 um, US Airlines when something happens to me, and I'm sure that no one listens 
after I record my complaint? What happens in your case? It goes into a group that is independent. They report to the board of directors, ultimately, and they have the ability to determine what is the appropriate next step as it relates to investigating that issue. So if it has anything to do with my team or the finance organization or me, I don't ever even know about it. So it goes up through a process where a separate independent group, sometimes legal, could be audit, could be an outside investigatory uh, group that we hire, is given the responsibility then to uh, determine what are the facts associated with what has been raised as a potential issue, and we come to grips with uh, whether or not action needs to be taken. And that action, uh, if we ultimately do determine that there has been something that has occurred, uh, always, always results in termination associated with those that are involved. So it is a zero tolerance policy, and it just depends upon the circumstances and facts as it relates to that. And, and you- But the, the, the fact that that's companies headquartered in other countries don't live up to those standards makes it more difficult for you to bid for contracts or our people know what our expected standards are okay we educate we go through a training process once a year we have a certification process where everyone that is responsible for touching outside external uh, parties in our organization have to personally certify that they understand our, our code of ethics and what the responsibilities are. And so they have no excuse if they ever do something that is against the standards, even if it may be an acceptable thing in a particular culture. I'm from construction company in Japan. And uh, as like uh, Jacob Engineering, my company constructs various social infra infrastructure in Japan. And uh, Japan has developed social infrastructure after the uh, World War II. So the demand for new construction is shrinking every year. But uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, social infrastructure, uh, including roads, bridges, water pipes, and buildings are becoming very old. So we need to prepare for now old buildings in the country. So it is said that uh, construction companies has to have to change business model operation. And I think uh, many other countries in the world will face similar problem in the future. So how, do you have any idea about uh, this uh, change of construction or engineering business? Yeah, yeah look, uh, infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is a big word right now that's used uh, very loosely across the globe, but I will tell you that the, the spend that's going to be necessary to, to create the infrastructure needs of the, in the next 50 to 100 years is huge. And, and so there is a, a tremendous opportunity uh, to ultimately, for a company like ours to be uh, participating in that growth agenda. So I think um, there's a couple points I would make. Uh, first thing is, is that Construction companies, and I'm going to call it engineering and design companies as well, what we love to do is we love to engineer and we love to design and we love to do those things that result in the coolest thing that's out there, right? And we become less concerned about making money. We may design and engineer that bridge and it's the coolest thing and it gets all kinds of awards, but if we don't make any money, I call that a hobby. Uh, hobbies are things that don't pay the bills. And, and so at the end of the day, uh, I think the biggest opportunities for an engineering and design firm is to leverage the talent and the capabilities of these incredible folks around the globe that do this stuff that are way above my pay grade as it relates to making these special infrastructure needs come to fruition. Uh, let them do that in a way that translates into a value creation opportunity for our shareholders. And what ends up happening is that we, as an, as an industry, and Jacobs is part of this, we like to do too much to get to what that finish line looks like when we don't really need to do that. So how do we get to the point where the supply and the issue is solved for our customers and we're making 
some really, really good returns relative to that. I think that is a huge change element in this industry that needs to effectively change. And I'll tell you, in Jacobs, we're along that path. That's why I actually came to this organization, because I felt that there was an ability to start to change the fundamental aspects about engineering the coolest thing in the world and not making any money, but engineering something that's really important for society, really important for the infrastructure needs of a country, and make some money doing it. This is the MBA in you coming out this is big time, huh? This is, this is UCLA. This is all UCLA. <laughs> so ultimately, how do you do that in a way that creates value for our shareholders? And if you figure out how to do that and you're able to win those projects, at the end of the day, you are going to be a material player within that 50 to 100 year build of the infrastructure around the globe. So let me... Let me uh, piggyback on the, on the question and, and on your answer. So you say you want to build this beautiful structure from an engineering point of view, but also make money for your shareholders, which I think it's exactly the way to go. But let me ask you on the beautiful side, how is the relationship with, uh, between uh, Jacobs and architectural firms? Um, so I'm thinking of big infra infrastructure projects. So one of the things that we've been talking here in this country is that most of our airports are a disgrace. Right? And I try to think, uh, you guys should be building more airports. And I think, well, which is the latest nice airport that was built in this country from an architectural point of view? It's Reagan in DC, which was designed by an Argentine uh, architect who used to be the dean of the Yale School of Architecture, Cesar Pelli, who is the guy who designed the Blue Whale here, the, the Pacific Design Center. How do you, and, and Santiago Calatrava is very much in demand for building these beautiful but very expensive uh, bridges. How do you, as a company, your philosophy as a company, deal with this Architects that uh, Calatrava is well known for being very extravagant and, 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 and wanting to do more and more. Do you have an easy relationship with these artists, architects, or do you look at them with some suspicion? How does, how does this go? <laughs> um, translating a, a design element, an architectural masterpiece into something that's functional is the, is the magic, right? And, and so uh, we, we have our architects. Uh, that do a lot of work within, the, within our own company, but we partner all the time with, the, with architectural firms around the globe. And, and what customers ultimately want is how does, you know, what is the cost of something? And what, how long will it take? And is it functional? And will it work at the end of the day? Okay, more questions from the audience. How do you go about simplifying procedures and protocols for your employees? It's probably the most difficult question uh, in global business today in terms of how to, to get to that, that right answer. So you, you look at our company, it's soon to be a $15 billion company and the, the variability in customers, the variability in things we do are extraordinary as, as we were talking about in the initial commentary. So the, the key is, what is important for us to be strategically and competitively advantaged, and what is not? So what I would argue for is the things that allow us to win that business and execute that project, whatever it looks like, that translates into profitability, there's complexity that's allowed there. Everything else, and I'm gonna call it the machine, the machine of a company, it's the structure, the, the ERP systems, the processes, the AP, the collection of cash, the application of cash. It, the, the machine gets complicated the more that you allow these things to, to leak. So leak into greater levels of complexity. So if you have an ability to figure out where that layer stops in terms of, look, you know, my finance and IT organizations, which I have, which are probably a couple thousand people, 3,000 people that are reporting to me. And, and at the end of the day, 
do we, are we going to be competitively advantaged if we report our numbers accurately? No. It's kind of a table stakes, right? You've got to do it. Are we going to be competitively advantaged if, if we report our numbers two days faster? No. So you determine what is the real needs of driving competitive advantage, and you simplify that through process, consistency, discipline, and a characterization of this is the way we do it. And I don't care that you have a different level or a different customer. This base kind of requirement, if we can get that systematized, then you start to have cost effectiveness, simplicity, speed, and you start to get greater insights into managing the organization. And I never really responded to, to Sebastian's comment about bots and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, if you start to do that, that is a technology that's here today in terms of creating perhaps humanless capabilities that are effectively almost closing the books. Can't do that if you've got a lot of folks running around tweaking relative to the complexity of the business around the globe. So, if you can figure out that separation between those two requirements, then your businesses are freed up to spend every waking moment, and I'm, I'm calling businesses customer facing, business development, project managers, the folks that are making the money for us. They are spending 100% of their time doing that and less about the machine. And the more that we can do that and free up their time, and by the way, because we've made it consistent, we give them information quicker. There's one version of the truth. Spreadsheets are eliminated. A pipe dream, I get it. But ultimately, to the extent there is one version of the truth, and people talk about what that one version of the truth, you don't talk about what the number is. You talk about what's the solution. All of those things get geometrically expanded in a big organization where you lose speed. You lose the ability to get insight to the business on a timely basis. And so simplicity is more about that discussion. Actually, complexity could end up being a competitive advantage in some pieces of our business. I'll take that all day long as long as I get paid for okay, it. Okay, great. So let's see. Let's see one question on this side. How have you taken your finance position to really be a catalyst and drive the strategy and, and kind of play that role? He gives no budget to the bad people in the organization. Um, he has the power of the purse. It, it's probably the most important question for, I think, finance executives today, actually. You're, you're getting at a, a, a key issue where, historically speaking, a CFO was a, the, the purse string holder, the, the, the no person, the, the you know, closing the books and making sure you, you're complying and all that kind of stuff. Party spoiler, right? Which, which is, you know, you got to do that because that's kind of required. But if that's all you're doing, you're not driving the strategic agenda of the company. So I think what's really important is when we talk about confluence of strategy and finance, you measure the implications of what that finance strategy looks like. So every company I've been in, I've demanded that we peel away the onion at very low levels in an organization. Define it how you want, by project, by office, by customer, by geography, whatever it is, I want a full understanding of the profitability of that company, or of that effort, and fully allocate all the costs. So they could even get a piece of the cost of me, right? Because if you're not paying the bills, you're actually not doing anything for us. You gotta pay the HOA fee, so to speak, the homeowners association fee being part of the company, right? And if you're not paying at least that, that's a challenge. So delineating your portfolio and understanding however it needs to be sliced and diced, to understand profitability is critically important. Once you understand that, then you can ask the questions as to why. Why is this good? Why is that bad? Why is this break even? And sometimes it's to do with us collectively as a team, and we can figure out how to improve the one that's not doing well and be a good performer. And sometimes the ones that are the best performers are leaving tremendous amounts of money on the table. So having that visibility first, 
then allows the strategic planning process to marry that up with markets, customers, and how then you can create competitive advantage versus that. So where you want to combine the two is what you're good at. And in my definition, sometimes that's just as simple as where you make money and where it's going to be bigger tomorrow than it is today. And if you marry those two, that creates a prioritization of your business efforts. And what's most important in there, not necessarily is what you're going to do, because typically people have a good view of kind of where we're good. What's really important is to say what you're not going to do. So when you're asking for resources, that's where you're going to take the resources. And you're not going to give the resources there until it's proven that there's an ability to have a return profile that's appropriate. So that confluence of, of what I would call financial metrics with market dynamics and what we can actually make money on and what's growing and how labor pools are able to support our ability to do that, that's when the magic comes in. And if you can combine the two where the market dynamics are positive and our ability to make money is positive, then you create something that's pretty, pretty special. And if you can communicate enough to get this alignment where people are all going that, this direction, like I was talking about, and that, that one team that is not making the money is driving that way, as long as they understand their role and their role is to try and improve and not grow, that's an incredible asset for a large, complex organization. So they're not out there spending resources to try and drive growth, because they know we don't want that. What we'd rather you do is make more money, and how do you do that? And if you can't do that, then we make a tough decision. So that's very interesting. Let me try to sort of elaborate on that. If you have a client who wants to do something really stupid, OK? But there is some money for you there. And, 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 and what do you tell the client? And, and let, me, let me elaborate, because it's, uh, this is not a trick question. So uh, uh, FDR got into a big fight, and then he fired uh, his uh, deputy secretary um, uh, of the Treasury, Dean Acheson, who then went to do big things in the Truman administration, because Acheson didn't want to do something and FDR told him, lawyers are not supposed to tell clients whether what they're doing is stupid or not, but whether it's legal. So do you tell a client, so let's say a really small, poor country comes to you and wants to have a satellite program, which you look at the country and say, these guys cannot pay their bills, their kids don't go to school. Do you tell them this is really stupid, or do you, you, you think that you're professional job is to do whatever they want to do in the best possible, most efficient, effective, low cost way. Okay, so you're, you're characterizing the question in a black and white mode. It's never black and white is the first point I would make. But the way that you characterize it, I would say, no, we're not going to do that. Okay. What about something you haven't done before? How, I know that you would do it. How, tell me, what's the process? You say, you meet with them, you, 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 you bring a team. This what would be the movie? This was a, a, a short YouTube movie on this really exciting project. So this gets to accountability, uh, which is one of the things that I think CFOs have a material ability to impact in an organization. And so it gets about transparency of the numbers, but accountability is a real big thing. And as companies get bigger, accountability gets tougher. Because uh, you know I use a term, it's easy to hide in big organizations. And I don't mean that negatively, I just mean it's, there's just so much going on. It happens, right? That it happens. And at, at the end, so if there is that opportunity in front of us, we need to have a discussion and say, okay, so you are going to go after this effort. That probably translates into a loss-making activity for a certain period of time, whatever it is. Three years, two years, four years. So what, why? Why do we do that? And what's the logic associated with doing that? And what does that translate into longer term? I have a philosophy on, on profitability. And I talked about the good and the bad of our portfolio to the, the earlier question on strategy and finance and the confluence of such. I would never want, I would never want 
everything in our company be profitable. Never. Because then we're never driving the growth agenda going forward. There's always got to be a sense of going after something that is an investment in our future. And so the key is once you agree to what those are, what does it look like? And what's the accountability associated with ultimately the return? If we're doing it because it's cool, like I said, it's a hobby. If we're doing it because it's investing in something that translates into substantive cash flow longer term, then we look at that, determine what the risk profile is, and we make a determination whether it's, it's warranted for our shareholders. But that's So that. accountability, transparency. Absolutely. So you talked a little bit about your um, arrival into Jacobs, and you mentioned when you interviewed and you wanted to know. So you were before going to Jacobs at Nestlé and at International Flavors and Fragrances, which is also a food sector company. So Nestlé and IFF, they are sort of in the same sector. I mean, no one would have said, oh, Kevin is, oh, I'm so surprised. But moving from IFF, at least to the non-informed, to Jacobs Engineering, uh, it's like changing sectors. It's like uh, being uh, a Dodgers uh, fan and then um, routing for the cabbies or something like that. So, so how was that from a personal point of view? Interesting. Because some of these, uh, I mean, people are now changing careers and changing industries and, and, uh, and I, I, I find it fascinating having been a professor all my life. So look, I think one thing I do well, uh, I never assume I know everything. And, and learning, learning is a fun thing uh, for me. And so if I, I take my experiences with Nestle and I, I leverage them into you know, a, a really exciting time at IFF and now I'm here at something completely different. What, what I'm very comfortable with is my ability to listen and learn. Because I came into this company um, having some thoughts about how I could help, but also knowing that I didn't know anything about this industry. And the one thing that I did think that was able to be done, and it's probably one of the reasons I went to IFF when I left Nestle, is I saw a company that had fantastic bones and was an extraordinary leader and had probably misstepped a few times in terms of performance. And I saw exactly the same thing with Jacobs, to be honest. And the things that I've been talking about relative to how we've been talking about strategy and confluence of, of finance and whatnot have nothing to do with an industry. It just has to do with leading people and getting alignment in large organizations. And if you can do that uh, and it create excitement and spark things in, in uh, an organization collectively that's made up of people, really incremental value can be unleashed, which has never been expected. And so I felt like I could do that. Okay. So let me, let me ask a, a, a question here. When you arrived in Jacobs and took uh, the big uh, corner office uh, in Pasadena, right? Yes. Yes. And you were coming from international flavors and fragrances. I mean, for an engineer, that doesn't sound very like sturdy, right? <laughs> Did you notice that some of the people that worked for you were rolling their eyes and were not, I mean, how difficult was it at that level? So I want our students to know this and I want them to be willing to jump ship when the other side looks good and when it's a challenge, but, but how difficult was it? I mean, did they, I'm sure that some rolled their eyes. I mean, you, you have thick skin, you, how, how did you handle that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That there, there was a a fragrance a, guy coming to run an engineering uh, company. There, the, was the, a, there must have been some of that, right? There was a progress. There was a process. Um, and and what you do is is you gain respect in that process through what I would suggest as listening, and and ultimately determining and learning from the respective organization. Because Jacobs, as a company, was a leading company before I ever showed up. Their, their, the heritage and legacy of that company is, is incredible. 
and, and so coming in and kind of saying, well, this is the way we're going to do things doesn't make a lot of sense. But starting to talk about have we considered different ways? Have we thought about doing this? How about making some choices where we can double down on this and maybe not do so much of that uh, was actually pretty easy because in this company because one thing that engineers know is they get numbers. I, I mentioned to the, the group here that uh, Kevin uh, is one of the members of our board and he has been incredibly helpful. And he has been very generous uh, with uh, Anderson, with his time, his resources, and so on and so forth. Talk us about philanthropy and the sense, I mean, many of our students here are international students, come from different cultures. Uh, tell us how important you think it is that successful business people, executives, give back to society which is a very American thing to do. And it's not that common in other cultures. Not that they are stingy, but it's not. So talk about philanthropy a little bit. Uh, look, I think it's, um, I feel very, very blessed. Uh, my wife and I have had an extraordinary experience uh, in, in our life together. And, and the ability to have been to the places that we've been to and experienced different cultures and, and whatnot. So, so we, we have a, a, a view of kind of uh, incredibly blessed to have been able to, to experience what we have so far. And, and I think that the, the more that um, executives uh, understand that, and you know, look, there's luck along the way that happened. It wasn't just you know me. It was a series of things. It was mentors I've had. It's being at the right place at the right time, or whatever it was. It, it uh, sure you, we had something to do with it, but we're blessed. And the ability and the recognition of an organization when they see executives doing that, it, they get even more excited about being part uh, of the organization. I would just add one little comment specifically to Jacobs, which is really, really an important hallmark of the company. They have, a, they have um, safety as part of the, one of the core parts of the value proposition for the company. And we have a thing that's called Beyond Zero. And Beyond Zero is the concept of, um, you know, you talk about zero accidents, we want to go beyond zero. So we want to create an environment where every single person in our company is not only worried about when they're on the job, but they're worried about when they're home with their families, when they're going to and from work. They, we want to be a beyond zero accident uh, kind of company. This company, as you may recall, there was a large uh, explosion in, in a, a BP facility in Texas City about 12 years ago. Uh, almost 20 people died in that, in that explosion. Uh, 15 of them were Jacobs employees. So that led us down a path of reinventing what this really means to us as a collective set of employees. And it gets a little bit to your question about trying to do the right thing, but this is, we have a, this culture of, look, you, if you are tired and you need to go to a meeting, you don't go to that meeting if you have to drive to get there. And it's okay to miss that meeting. And it's okay to, take a, a train to the, to, the, to the next meeting as opposed to driving in the middle. Those things are expected of our, ourselves in an organization and it gets to what is a really powerful thing in the company which is a culture of caring and it's kind of very much related to your Very question. much so. Okay, great. So, two last questions and I'm going to ask them together and you can answer them in uh, any order you want and this also gives you the opportunity to not answer one of them. So, <laughs> So question number one, this is that the one you may not want to answer, is what was the most important thing that you learned at Anderson? And number two, if you had to give one piece of advice to our wonderful group of students here, uh, what would that be? So there's, uh, I'm going to answer them both, but they're very connected, mm -hmm. uh, I would say. I think um, certainly my experience here at Anderson, I was in the fully employed program back in the old ages. You guys have this incredible facility. We did not have the same facility when I was here. Oh, it was, it was very quirky, but it was, was interesting. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> quirky, that was a, that's a good term as to what it was, quirky. Um, but, but one thing that was really encouraged as, as part of the education was team. 
Okay? And, and when you get into an organization of substance, whether that's three people, two people, or 50,000 people, team is how it ultimately gets done. And so the ability to influence, the ability to manage teams, and not only your team, but the teams that your team is interacting with, the companies that figure that out are the best companies in the world. And, and so that is very, very, very important. There was also one other thing that um, as part of the education is it's no, uh, I would say it was, we were talking about career aspirations and I, I never forget this. We we're talking about what you wanted to be when you grow up, right? And trying to figure out what's important to you. And so we had this one question, which was, okay, um, you have this specific opportunity in, in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, I, that was the that was the city that was. Do you still remember? Us. Yeah, absolutely. It's really cold there. And, I know, and it was talked about within the construct of you know know yourself. What's important to you, and and whether or not that Duluth, Minnesota opportunity was going to be something. Now I expand that beyond that specific question, but know who you are, and be true to who you are. You know there are great leaders in this company that are introverts. And, and they are true to themselves and people respect that. And there are great leaders that are over the top in terms of flamboyant and you know, out there. And what I will say, there's room for all types of leaders. And what is most important about leadership is being authentic. Authentic with who you are, what you believe your skill sets are, and, and then do what makes sense for you relative to that. And that may take you down different paths because some organizations may have different views of what they want as a leader. So be it. God bless, God bless them and they're, that's their issue, not yours. What you want to do is be happy, excited, and true to yourself and ultimately drive your agenda. I, you guys are all very, very talented people. I cannot Be think. True. Yeah, yeah. I cannot think of a better way of ending this. Be authentic. I think that's the best piece of advice. So we want to thank Kevin Berryman for his wonderful presentation. <laughs>